Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the southern tip of Vancouver Island in Western Canada. I hope everybody is having a super week so far. Hi Marjona, Dublet Beck, Kanupriya, Tammy, Simran. Good to see many students in the class. Welcome to our chat moderator, Carolina. In this class, everyone, we are looking at an IELTS listening section, listening for band nine. Specifically, this listening will focus on topics on taxes for part three and Michelangelo, the famous sculptor and artist for part four. Uh, this listening material is taken from our web materials at aehelp.com for academic IELTS and gieltshelp.com for general IELTS. The listening is the same in both the academic and the general, so you will find this material on both the academic and general websites. This is our academic IELTS website here with the blue background. You just click this big red button to join the premium package. You fill out your information and then you are off to the races. You have a My Student account where you will find practice exams, a full interactive course, a workbook, study plans, lesson videos, over 100 hours of HD videos, and audio CDs. We're going to use these audio CDs today for today's listening, so you will be able to listen. And of course, uh, you have student partner speaking and interviews uh, for everyone as well. All right, hello Umesh. Dormna, Rumi, good to see many more people in the class. For general IELTS, it's the same idea, gieltshelp.com, red button. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access, so it is super well worth it. Um, we are an official IELTS test registration center and certified agents. We help hundreds of students uh, succeed in their IELTS goals every day. You can read their uh, stories on our testimonials. Um, again, uh, students, if you have any questions about our product, send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com or about IELTS. Um, you can download our apps, Academic IELTS Help, General IELTS Help, there's lots of free materials in our apps, as well as our Instagram, IELTS underscore AE Help and G IELTS Help. Check out our Instagram uh, profiles, lots of goodies there. Students, uh, right now, uh, listening uh, tomorrow, Task 1 Graphs and Speaking Part 1 for everybody. Uh, let's get into today's listening. Taxes coming up, Ooh. and it's tax season. I don't know about other countries, but in Canada, tax season is from uh, January to April. If people don't file their taxes by April, it's overdue. I gotta do my taxes. So taxes it is. Let's learn a little bit about taxes. Um, so I'm going to uh, play this uh, audio for you, let's hop over to our exam here. Okay, I'm seeing what you're seeing. So this is section three, this is taxes. Maybe I can make this a tiny bit bigger for us like that, so it's easier to see, especially if you're on mobile. Um, we did part one and part two last week, but if you missed it, it's totally fine. Uh, you can just focus on part three, part four today. Uh, now, since 2020, they call this part three. Um, and uh, while you're listening, put the answers into a separate document. Do not um, put it in the chat, just because it's confusing for other viewers, especially if you're giving the wrong answer. Okay, so here we go, everybody. We're uh, going to listen and answer, and I will go through the answers after and talk strategy. So. I'm just uh, hopping back to the website here if you're wondering what I'm doing. And I'm looking for um, 
CD5, track three. Okay, CD5, uh, track three. Here we go, everyone. Listen and answer. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, yeah, just a sec, CD5, I was on CD4. Here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. and two contributors, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Well, countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3,000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr. Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs, or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier. In my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximise profit for big international businesses. I know Dr Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. Dr Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse. But these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. Okay, okay, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country As a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with it. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, everyone, check those answers in that half minute. Let me just hop back to our website, aehelp.com here, and stop the audio before it goes on to part four. And we'll look at part three and go over the answers and talk some strategy. Because there certainly are some important steps here that we can take. Now, if you were here last week, you probably knew that we were going to be listening to taxes because one of the strategies we used when we looked at part one and part two is we actually did a little bit of review of each of the uh, topics of each of the four parts. So um, we had a chance to kind of think about the fact that this is taxes and something about trade um, and uh, the way trade works uh, in different places around the world. So um, here we go. How long ago was the first record of trade between nations? And here, this is a question. So strategy number one, students, is turn questions into statements. And you probably saw me do that with the multiple choice as well, okay? So turn questions into statements. Uh, This will help you catch the info more. Okay. All right. So here I was thinking, you know, maybe they'll say something like trade began or it started. And I believe what they actually said was the first record of trade was. So they kind of took a piece from there, right? And we got Simran and Dublad Beck saying it was 3,000 years ago. Yeah. So how long ago was the first record of trade between nations? 3,000 years. So 3,000 was the correct number. And they think, I can't remember, they said between the Egyptians and the Arabic nations or China, I can't remember. But it said 3,000 years ago, which is good. Um, Simran, use the number. Don't use um, the uh, letter. It should actually say no more than one word or... Uh, a number okay 
All right. Um, now, uh, here we had uh, complete the flow chart. This is a very popular type of question in the IELTS listening. Uh, for the computer based, it's usually like a drag and drop um, where you've got some answers and you're dropping them in. And notice how I highlighted um, a couple of key terms here. This is strategy two. Okay. Um, there are some terms that are likely going to be used. So, strategy two. Strategy two, uh, pay attention to uh, terms that you will likely hear, likely, likely hear, so you can position yourself in the audio, such as names and dates, okay, uh, numbers in general, right? So here we had this number 20%, and um, yeah, I mean, it's very likely you're going to hear the speaker use the word 20% because there's not, I mean, they might say something like one-fifth, but they're likely not gonna paraphrase something like this, okay? So country A produces a 20%, uh, or sorry, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B. And again, it's likely that they're going to use country A, country B as terms, okay? Um, is everybody clear on that? So is everybody clear on what I mean by listen to those specific terms? Can I just get a couple of thumbs up if you're clear on what I mean by that? I wanna make sure that you really catch that. So don't, don't try to listen to just any word or phrases because most of this will be paraphrased. They're not going to say the same words, but certain words like country A or 20% or 1972 or uh, Dr. Sturgeon, Dr. Young, right? Okay. Cass says, yeah. Carolina is like, Psh. okay. Um, Edward is giving me one of these. Awesome. Um, yeah, so pay attention to those, okay? But otherwise, careful because they're paraphrasing, okay? Good. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, so a company in country A um, imports the product. If, country, if the country does not have a free trade agreement, the company must pay, uh, and many of you gave me this answer, Lee Thang Dat um, said it's a tariff. Cass's tariff with capitals like this, tariff. Yeah, using all capitals is okay. Don't mix. If you're gonna use all capitals, use all capitals. If you're not gonna use all capitals, then don't use all capitals, don't mix it. Uh, just be careful because using all capitals can be slower and you can make more mistakes in the paper-based exam. Computer-based exam, you just hit caps lock and write all capitals, okay? All right, so tariff. Computer-based exam though, you often don't write for these kinds of questions, you just drag and drop. Okay, so tariff is the correct answer here. Uh, tariff or tax, tax would also be okay, all right? Uh, this is to level the playing field. Now here's another little trick, okay? Level the playing field is in quotation marks. So when you see these quotation marks, it means it's a direct quote from the audio. So it's not maybe you will hear this, but you will hear this, okay, in the audio. So pay attention to terms that you will likely hear, and then even more so, I mean, if you're lucky enough, uh, pay attention to uh, quotation marks, okay? Um, as this indicates, a direct uh, speech or direct quote uh, from the audio and you will hear it, okay? Will hear this, okay? Remember, yeah? Okay, so pay attention to that especially because if you didn't catch the first answer and you're seeing these quotation marks and you're hearing uh, level the playing field, it means that they've already gone past that first answer, okay? 
And Doublet Beck says this answer should be domestic manufacturers, which it is, but just make sure about those quotation marks, okay? So domestic manufacturers. is the correct answer. Now again, I like to use lowercase personally. I think it's important to learn capitalization. I recommend doing the same um, when you're practicing, okay? When you're on the IELTS, you might wanna use all capitals so you don't lose marks by accident. But when you're at home um, and you're just learning the language, I would say use common nouns, proper nouns in their correct or common forms, okay? All right, here we go. Um, if the countries do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay to import the item. Of course, it's free trade, right? Some advocates of protectionism believe free trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large corporations. Logic, logic will help you here too. I mean, what are they maximizing? Cass says it's gotta be profit. Uh, Oxen John says, yeah, profit, I think. Um, Oxen John, when you think, be confident. You're probably right. So profit it is. Lena, Dorna, Arda, Marjona, Zakshikabar uh, also says profit. Angelo says profit, right? <clears throat> Good, profit. Profit or profits? Um, profit or profits, both are okay here because both work, but it is important to have the plural correct. Maximizing profits or profit. Um, it doesn't always work though, so careful with plurals. Sometimes you have to have the correct, well actually not sometimes, usually, most of the time, you need to have the correct singular or plural form of the noun. In this case, both profit and profits work. You can use either one, but be careful. Pravasha, yeah, profit or profits, both are okay here, okay, because both are correct grammatically. All right, Oxen John says, yeah, I've preferred confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so here we've got a little bit of fill in the blank action going on, right? No more than three words and or a number for each answer. Hmm, all right, some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the noun and not be sidetracked by the needs of the. Um, two words for this, obviously, make sure that if you're in the paper-based exam, you put both words in number 25, otherwise you'll be off when it comes to the rest of the questions. Cass says it's, uh, we must, emphasize the needs of the many and not be sidetracked by the needs of the few. Yeah, life is not perfect. Oftentimes we're in juxtaposition about uh, majority, majority votes, right? We can't make everybody happy. So the correct answer here is many and few. And when you're doing this in the paper-based exam, the order has to be correct. So if you write few first, of course you'll get it wrong because it would be the wrong answer. So many and few. Okay, uh, number 26, uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases what? Now again, students, and I said this before today, this is strategy three, okay? And this is probably the most important strategy for the entire IELTS exam, is use your logic. Okay, you gotta be like Captain uh, Spock, you know, or uh, with the ears, right? Um, if you're Trekkies, if you're fans of Star Trek, so you have to be highly logical. Um, use your logic. You can figure out answers even if you did not catch it in the audio. Just think of reality and uh, logic, okay? So free trade, 
if we're trading goods for free, um, then um, it's going to drop the price. The price will go down because it's going to increase what? Anish Kafle says competition. Uh, Lion Black agrees with Marjona. Competition. I agree as well. It is competition. Okay. Um, competition is one of the cornerstones of capitalism, creating competition uh, for best quality with the lowest price. Free trade makes that more possible. Yeah, it's going to be the right answer. Okay. IELTS doesn't lie, so IELTS is not going to come up with a false answer just to give you a headache. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, now we have this cause and effect, and notice how for this questions 27 to 28, um, I highlighted the, uh, the, the topic of each category here. Okay, and Ruslan Asadova, I see you over there in our general out, so keep answering Ruslan. I saw the 3000, it's all good. Okay, um, so think about that. Cause, the country enters into free trade agreements. Effect, jeopardizes human rights standards. Okay, so there's free trade, um, jeopardizes human rights standards. Why? Because of course, competition also will lead countries, people, to cheat or be unethical or be unfair to try to be the best with the lowest price, right? Um, so uh, that happens as well. So entering into free trade agreements jeopardizes human rights standards. Yeah, okay. Um, like sweatshops collapsing. So factories that just... Okay, the conditions. So these terrible conditions are highlighted in the... What? Where do we see it? Dublut Beck. Qatar says hello, everyone. Um, Marjona... Double it back, uh, brawler BS, um, and Prabhasha say it's the media. Yeah, in the news, right? You're watching the news and you see the news that, oh, there's a factory in Malaysia owned by Apple and people are jumping out the windows. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, these terrible uh, situations happen. I can't remember where that Apple factory was, but yeah. And I don't mean the fruit, I mean the digital uh, technology. Okay, um, the realization that such incidents are not isolated. So, you know, it's not just one or two. This happens. It happens in many places around the world. Implore. Implore means like demand, encourage and demand. Uh, companies and something to raise the bar means make it better. Um, Arda... Sokchi Akbar Said Ansari says government. It's not government. Arda Rohit Sokchi Akbar governments. How do I know that governments is a plural here? So how do I know that governments has to be plural? There's a, there's a there's a definite giveaway. There's a tell. Okay, so. This is strategy five. Okay. Um, often you can uh, figure out, and you must figure out, uh, you can figure out whether or not a noun answer uh, should be plural or singular by looking at the grammar, Asadova, yeah, governments, absolutely, uh, at the grammar. Uh, look for articles, a uh, or an. If you see a or an, it's singular. No article, likely plural. Okay, and the other one, Carolina, our moderator, is saying, well, look at the other nouns in the list. Um, in this case, we have companies, and companies is a plural. So um, because of uh, 
parallel grammar. Um, yeah, you're right, Carolina. Um, it should be plural as well, right? So no article, likely plural. Um, and look at other nouns. Are they plural or singular? Okay. If plural, then plural. If singular, then singular. Okay, it's the rule of uh, parallel grammar forms. All right. Okay. All right, um, here we go. So now for 29, notice how again I was using that strategy where I was focusing on a key word that I'm sure I would hear, like Dr. Young. And I did hear it. And then Dr. Young argues that free trade um, allows um, people to be more prosperous and is a positive step towards the right goal. Okay, so I took notes here, okay? So take notes, take a couple of notes for long um, multiple choice questions and then match it up with the correct answer. So match up your answer with the correct answer. Okay, so here, okay, Mr. or Dr. Uh, Young says uh, uh, free trade. Um, it's uh, helping people be more prosperous. It's a positive step. Um, a, free trade agreements are the single biggest economic driver for making the world a better place. Okay, it kind of matches. Uh, free trade agreements are not perfect, but they're a good step towards increasing global welfare. That seems really good. That seems like a very close match. Um, free trade agreements are not always positive. Uh, well, they, he says they are positive, but can be an important way to level the playing field. Um, I really like B. I think B is the closest match. Everybody agrees? Yeah, Dorna, Rohit, Golnoza, um, Saeed, they all seem to agree that B is the closest match. Okay, more prosperous, positive step. I mean, he doesn't emphasize that they are the biggest economic driver. He's not, he's kind of like, eh, well, they're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Okay. And then Dr. Sturgeon on the other side, right, for protectionism, um, says the rich get richer and the middle class gets laid off with free trade. So it was kind of a tricky one because it's like an inverse kind of hinted answer here. So overall wealth has increased in society. Uh, middle class jobs are the foundation of an economy that works for the few and not just for one. Uh, free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth in the hands of an elite few. Yeah, it looks like most people in the chat are agreeing with me. Okay. Asadova, you got the last one, right? That's awesome. Perfect. See, it is. Okay, everyone. Um, how did you do? What did you get out of... Um, so, how did you do? What did you get out of 10? What did you get from 10 questions uh, in part three? It Hopefully, you got at least six, okay? If you didn't get six, you're gonna be kind of in trouble. Uh, Rutvik says, I got 10, Rutvik. Boom, perfect score, that's super. Uh, Cass says, I got them all, that's really good. Simran, eight out of 10. Anish 8, Rohit 7, Saeed 8. Those are all really great. Your darling very honestly says, I got four. Your darling, definitely you wanna, you wanna practice. You need to get more than four to get those higher band scores. Okay, Lion Black says, thanks. Well, we're not done yet, Lion Black. I've got part four coming at you right now. And we're gonna do that right now. So here comes part four, everybody, hang in there. Um, before we do part four, just a quick overview of the strategies for uh, the uh, listening here, okay? So strategy number uh, one, all right? Um, 
Turn questions into statements, okay? This will help you catch more of the information, all right? Um, strategy number two, uh, pay special attention to terms that you will likely hear so you can position, you can identify where you are in the audio. Um, these are dates, numbers, uh, names of people, and pay special attention to those quotation marks because you will hear that information, okay? All right, um, strategy number three, arguably the most useful strategy of all. It's what makes us special as humans. Um, use your logic. You can figure out answers, even if you don't catch it in the audio, just think of you know, a logical answer to the question. Okay, um, we skipped strategy four, so I'm gonna rename this strategy four. Okay, uh, strategy four, you can figure out if a noun is a plural or singular by looking at the articles like a or un in the statements and you can look at the other nouns. So if you have a noun like companies um, and it's plural, governments will also be plural. Okay, all right. So uh, keep those strategies in mind. Let's get cracking on um, part four here. Okay, I'm just gonna hop back to our website, uh, start up audio for number four. Now part four is gonna be very smooth and seamless. So get ready for this, everyone. Okay, there's no breaks now here. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture on the lesser known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome, and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome, and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. 
I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art, and well respected for this architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the years spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul, harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, and definitely check those answers. And then you got a little bit more time to check all your answers. If you're doing the paper-based exam, you have 10 minutes um, after that. So you have basically 10 and a half minutes at the end of uh, part four uh, to do this. Okay, that was pretty quick, you know, challenging, some challenging terms, but that's a standard part four of the IELTS exam. Uh, many of you who have taken part or the IELTS um, will know that that's part four, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, everyone. So let's take a peek at this. Uh, let's go over the answers uh, together and um, let's identify what's going on here. A lot of the same strategies that we talked about in part three. So paying attention to names, to dates, uh, paying attention to paraphrasing becomes very important in part four. So uh, strategy right off the bat. Okay. Uh, so strategy, um, paraphrasing or paying attention and catching paraphrasing of keywords becomes essential, necessary for part four success. Okay, I'll show you that as we go along. So the words that are used. So even in the beginning here, um, so you had to match up on the exam. So some materials were either on the exam um, and some materials were not on the exam. So you had to choose correct letter A to B. Um, the material from the third uh, class of the week uh, will be on the exam or will not be on the exam. Me says uh, B, I think, um, because uh, it's not going to be on the exam because she says uh, the last class of the week and the last weeks, they will not be on the exam. Um, me, you're absolutely right. It's not on the exam. Um, but she does say that uh, materials from this class, uh, materials from this class is the current class, right? So that one is A, uh, will be on the exam. So the correct answers are B, and A, okay, B and A for 31 and 32, B and A. Uh, again, slight paraphrasing, she says from this class, right? So from this uh, class will be on the exam. Okay, so that's your paraphrasing right there. It doesn't say current class, current class is this class. Okay, and then we get into talking about Michelangelo. It's nice and fast and smooth. Um, here we go. While Michelangelo is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta and the statue named something thought to symbolize male beauty. Um, they, I remember they mentioned um, the statue of Mary but as we know, Mary is not a male. So we're looking for the male statue. The other statue that's mentioned is the statue of David that you saw in the thumbnail for this class, right? So that's the statue of David uh, thought to uh, symbolize male beauty. Yeah, absolutely. So we're listening for that. Very good, whoever got David. Uh, the D has to be a capital. 
if uh, you did not use a capital for David, you got it wrong. Okay, so Ramesh Kumar, careful. David with a small d would be wrong. Um, don't write statue of a because statue named statue of David is wrong. Okay, so mum, you would not write statue of David. You would just write David with a capital D. Careful, everyone. Architectural achievements, uh, far more than just a painter, Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on St. Peter's Basilica for some number of time until his death in 1564. Two words here. Um, he was lead architect for Laura. Very nice. Remember, Laura says that should be 17 years. Yeah. And if anybody's ever visited St. Peter's Basilica, it's quite amazing. Um, so 17 years until his death in 1564, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting structure because future something or someone and someone uh, faithfully carried out his designs. Who were those people? Two words for number 35. Uh, future popes. And I don't know how to spell popes. Oh, there it is. Pope. P-O-P-E with a capital P. So let's write popes. Future popes and architects. Okay, um, so use um, what you're given. You see the word architectural here? So you can use that to help you spell the word architects, right? Architectural, architect is there. You just need to stick an S on the end of it. So if you're like, but Adrian, I never write that word. I don't know how to write it. It's in the listening, okay? If you have to write it, shouldn't be hard popes same thing it's in the listening use the given information that's the strategy here okay so i think this is strategy six for today use the given information in the question booklet uh, to help you with answers and correct spelling boom Everybody got that? Thumbs up, yeah? We're all on page here. So if you if you don't get it right away, if you miss it, and you don't get the right spelling, just write down what you think it is or how you think you spell it, and then later on go, okay, I think that I saw that somewhere else in the listening. I can use that to help me figure out the right spelling. And I can see a couple of uh, people doing the boogie and giving some thumbs up, okay? All right, super. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. So um, let me just highlight the correct answers here and then we'll move on. Okay. There we go. Uh, Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city of something, city of something, including at the ancient Capitoline Hill site. It was a little bit of a tricky one. Lena says Vatican, but Vatican is actually not correct. Vatican is just, I mean, it helps to know a little bit about um, Italy here. Uh, Vatican is, is very small. Vatican is just like the holy kind of center of um that St. Peter's Square Basilica area. Um, but we're looking for the little bit bigger area of Rome here. Um, and uh, Capitoline Hill site is in Rome. Okay, so Rome is the correct answer here. You see Michelangelo's works all around Rome. Yeah. Um, servant of the papacy. So he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. He once built a something of the Pope only to see it melted down for cannon parts just a few years later. That What a loss, right? Too bad. 
Um, I guess they really needed those cannons. Simran says, bronze statue. Yeah, I guess, well, I guess metal back then was really valuable. They just didn't have nearly as much of it as we do now. Uh, bronze statue, I think if you write just statue, you'll get this one as well. But bronze statue is definitely the more accurate answer. So you want to be looking for that more accurate answer. So uh, melted down for cannon parts just a few years later. Moreover, the something he had to in uh, he had to work in were often substandard, often being forced to live and work in small, cramped places with a number of other men. Um, so going on to the the other part here, um, this makes sense. Again, this is where logic can help you figure this out. Marjona says conditions. Moreover, the conditions he had to work in, and here the plural is important, because uh, it's not just one condition. He often had different conditions that he had to work in, right? Um, and then we're going on to his literary works. I hope everybody has been paying attention to these titles, like uh, literary works, um, servant of the papacy, um, other works. Um, so I, I hope... Uh, people are paying attention to this okay these titles they're they're very kind of they're important they they give you an idea of what you're listening to okay all right it is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own what uh, Double up back Marjona and Simran all say 39 should be creativity. Yeah, and the audio does emphasize it. So she's like, it would be amazing if he were given reign over his own creativity. I mean, he was in some cases, like the st Statue of David. I think that was inspired, right? So there are some works. Okay, so creativity. I am carnage agrees creativity yeah okay um, and then number 40 something was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life though his writings never made much of an artistic impact they do offer a window into his tortured genius um, so yeah he maybe wasn't as great of a writer as he was a sculptor or architect um, but he certainly liked it and he wrote a lot of poetry yeah um, very clearly emphasized a couple of times there so last answer is poetry uh, students that's it if you are here for part one and part two what did you get out of 40 okay so what did you get from 40 on this uh, listening exam how did you do? Arda got 39 out of 40. Well, Arda, I can tell you right away that's a band nine because if you get 39 or if you get 40, then you get a band nine. Uh, Monisha, 37. Um, yeah, if you wrote only, yeah, oh, sorry, I thought you said you got 37. Uh, yeah, Monisha, if you wrote only statue for 37, it'll work. Yeah, it's fine, okay? Um, Carnage from Marvel Comics. Um, yeah, 19 out of 20 is great. So you probably weren't here for part one and part two, but that's great. Heavy Driver memes 26, so let's check that out. Okay, so here I'll show you where you can check out what you get right here. Okay, so here's our website, aehelp.com. And then here at the bottom of the website, let me make it ginormous for us, okay. It's ginormous. Uh, there's this score calculator that's uh, right there, right beside blog score calculator. You click on that. Woo, there it is. And then um, listening. Let me make it smaller so you can see it. Um, listening score, okay, uh, 26. 6.5. So 26, I mean, it's still not bad, right? 26 is a 6.5. Anish Kafli says, I got 35. Uh, 35 is a band 8. Marjona, 37, I believe, is a band 8.5. Yeah. Uh, Ramesh Kumar says, I got 32. Oh, 32, 7.5. Very nice. Cast, 35. 
Band 8 Cass. Very good. Okay, uh, students, check out our website, um, aehelp.com, for tons more uh, IELTS help. Um, as you saw, there's so much material there, and it doesn't cost a lot. And it's a one-time payment for lifetime access. You just click that big red button right there uh, to join our premium IELTS package, one-time payment, lifetime access. This is for the academic IELTS. General IELTS, you're on the green website, um, gieltshelp.com. Click that red button, join us there. Good work, everyone, today. I threw some fast-paced reading, listening lessons at you. Um, and you did it, you conquered, you did a fantastic job. That was awesome. Um, Carolina, thank you for moderating. Uh, Eugen, thank you for the emojis. Cass, thank you for being a member. Thank you viewers for watching. Remember, check us out on our websites. Join us for all of our lessons. It's well worth it. And uh, we've got uh, task one graphs and speaking part one coming up. Uh, tomorrow at the same time. I hope you all have an awesome rest of your day and I look forward to seeing you on your Friday. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I'm Adrian. I'm signing out from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada. Much love to all of you wherever you are on this big blue planet of ours. Bye for now.